Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hannah Stein. I'm a new tuber in Trust and Safety. And on behalf of the Culture Club in Farmington Hills, Juglers in Ann Arbor, and Talks at Google, I would like to invite or I would like to welcome you all to this special event in honor of Holocaust Remembrance Day. As the granddaughter of a German Jew who was one of the lucky few to flee Germany after watching his family members get taken to concentration camps, this is a topic that is very close to my heart. And that is why I'm honored to introduce our speaker for today, Sarah Weiss, the CEO of the Holocaust and Humanity Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. I've had the privilege of working with Sarah while I was a student at Miami University on the Holocaust and Education Council, or in Genocide Education Council. She's a true Holocaust scholar. Most recently, she successfully led the Holocaust and Humanity Center groundbreaking move to the Cincinnati Union Terminal, making it the only Holocaust museum with a direct connection to its physical location. There's a live chat throughout this talk. Please ask your questions through this feature and we will ask them at the end of the presentation. Without further ado, Sarah Weiss. Thank you, Hannah. It's an honor to be here and um, thank you for that lovely introduction um, and your work um, as an undergrad in ensuring the lessons of the Holocaust inspire action today. Um, I too am the grandchild of Holocaust survivors, and I'm really a generation that wasn't meant to be here. Uh, but I see my work both in, um, in preserving this history, but ensuring that this history uh, offers lessons for us today. So I hope um, the journey that I'm going to take you on through the museum uh, actually gives you some sense of the relevance, the importance, the significance of uh, the Holocaust for us in our world today. As Hannah mentioned, today marks the United Nations Day of Holocaust Remembrance. 76 years ago, the notorious camp Auschwitz was liberated. But actually for many, uh, liberation didn't come for months later. And actually, we have to ask ourselves, did liberation ever come at all? As the United Nations marks this day around the world with commemorations, uh, their theme is actually on this question of rebuilding in the aftermath of the Holocaust. And that's a perfect segue into the work and to the tour I'm gonna to take you on of our museum at the Holocaust and Humanity Center. So you're gonna come on a bit of a journey with me. We are actually in a train station in Cincinnati. You actually have to perhaps imagine for a moment bustling movement of people and energy uh, and, and we actually have to go back in time a bit to the 1930s uh, and the 1940s uh, when train travel in America was the main mode of, of transportation. Uh, so this bustling train station actually served as a hub of rebuilding. Um, for survivors at the end of the war, um, many of them had no homes to go back to, no communities, no family, no jobs. They had to look forward towards rebuilding. And many of them decided that they wouldn't stay in Europe. And so they looked to come to the United States, to go to other places around the world, uh, to rebuild their lives. And a few thousand survivors came to Cincinnati. They came to other parts of the country. Um, what makes this site that you're looking at right now unique is that many of the thousands of Holocaust survivors who arrived in this community arrived through this train station where I'm at today, where I'm taking you on this journey. So this train station is the actual site where the survivors came to rebuild their lives, to start over, um, to begin a new chapter. Also uh, of note in this building that we're in together in this grand rotunda that's, that you'll have to imagine is one in five World War II servicemen and women actually came through this building as well. So this site that we're in represents future, rebuilding, hope, and the aftermath. But we also have to understand what these individuals went through that brought them to find to, for the need to find a new home and the need for rebuilding. Uh, so we're gonna go on a little bit of a journey through their, some of their stories. In our uh, lobby, you see a mural. This mural that you're seeing snapshots of people's stories uh, represents the many stories of survivors. And we have to remember that every story is unique. Some of you may have read the diary of Anne Frank 
or Night by Elie Wiesel, or perhaps some other books in school or throughout the years. There could be thousands, hundreds of thousands of stories written because each of the experiences of those who went through the Holocaust is unique. Um, and that's why we try to capture it through testimony, through artwork, through a variety of medium, which you'll see in just a moment. Um, we're looking at, again, some of these stories of people who came through this space through snapshots of their story. So I'm pulling up right now. The story of Al Miller. You can see a little bit. Um, you might see some runners and hopefully you see a little boy cheering. Um, and he says, I saw my hero, Jesse Owens, win a gold medal at the 1936 Berlin Olympics. Al Miller is a survivor. He survived, he watched the Nazis come to power and ultimately uh, 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 strip away everything his family had in Germany. Um, but one of the things that Al talks about was that moment of the Berlin Olympics, actually Olympics that were threatened to be boycotted because of the Nazi policies against Jews and others. Uh, but he went, and what was his shining moment when he saw Jesse Owens, an African-American, win gold and watch Hitler walk out of that stadium? And so these are the stories, just a moment, of Al Miller's uh, stories that he shares and, and teaches us. Al today is 98 years old. He still talks about this moment, this moment of going to the Berlin Olympics as one of his most treasured memories but he has other lessons for us as well. Al teaches us that words matter and that the Holocaust didn't begin with bullets, it began with words. And so when we think about the lessons of this history, we challenge our visitors to think about that. Think about how words matter, how words matter in our world today and in each of our interactions we have. I skipped, uh, if you were really here in the museum, you would have seen a, a quite a long introductory video that covers the historical context of the rise of Nazism and the significance of the building in which I sit today, this train station. It also reminds us that we can't go back and change history and that the survivors in this introductory film one of them being Al Miller, who I just spoke about, says we can't go back and change history. And, and as we learn about the Holocaust and one of this, the darkest chapters in, in human history, uh, we might ask ourselves, we might be tempted to ask ourselves, what would I have done? Would I have been a perpetrator? Would I have been a bystander? Would I have been an upstander, somebody who helped? But we can't go back in time. We can't go back and say, what would I have done? All we can ask ourselves is what are we doing today? And so I hope this stays with you throughout our conversation is as we look back at the past, we can't change it. We hopefully will learn from it and we hopefully think about what are we doing today and how can we be the best of humanity today? So when you first come into the museum, you see an installation called Origins. Um, and the question is, how did this begin? How did the Holocaust begin? We could spend hours talking about the factors that led to the Holocaust, uh, the loss of World War I, the international uh, depression, the, um, the seeking scapegoats for, for that depression. Uh, and of course, a major factor that we can't overlook is the longstanding history of anti-Semitism that existed throughout Europe. And while there were many factors that led to this happening, without anti-Semitism, it wouldn't have been possible. And the Nazis repackaged age-old hatred of political, racial, and economic anti-Semitism and repackaged it and included, added to it, racial anti-Semitism, defining Jews as a race and targeting Jews in that way, using Jews as a scapegoat for the problems in Nazi Germany. And I'm sure many of you know this history. I say this because 
we know again in our world today that at times people are seeking scapegoats for problems. We're living through a really challenging time uh, with the pandemic and every other thing going on in our in our country and our world. And we have to remember and pay attention when people are seeking scapegoats to blame it problems on. Um, we also know that this anti-Semitism that existed in, in the Nazi rise to power is still with us today. Some of the same images, some of the same rhetoric, some of the same propaganda we see on the internet today. Uh, and so the history isn't only in the past, it also imp informs our present. But as we think about the factors that led to the Holocaust and led to what we're talking about today, we have to remember as well that this didn't happen to individuals who were nameless or faceless. These are individuals with names, with dreams, with hopes, just like you and me. And so some of the images you're seeing are of family life, everyday life in Europe just before the war between World War I and World War II. Um, and these individuals, again, had hopes and dreams and fears just like us. And the Nazis' goal was to dehumanize, to strip the humanity from these individuals. And we feel our responsibility is to give that humanity back in everything we do. Again, if we see uh, victims of the Holocaust solely as victims, how can we have empathy? How can we see their humanity? And same thing with the atrocities that we see in our world today, we have to look at uh, individuals as, 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 as that, as each person has a story, has a background, has a name, um, and, and people are not solely victims or survivors or nameless. Um, each person has a story and a place in, in, in our world. Um, and so these photographs uh, represent the many stories um, some of whom, some of which we know, and some stories that we never know. And for every photograph we have in our museum before the war, there's dozens of photographs that didn't survive the war because many families have not a single photograph because uh, their family possessions, their homes, their um, their their belongings were looted, burned, stolen. Um, and after the war, if they survived, if any family members survived, they had nothing to take with them. So every one of these photographs that did survive is a treasure for us. As we move into the museum, you see this installation called Power. And we talk about how did this happen? How did the Nazis come to power? How, did the, how was the Holocaust possible? And power is a big big question and big conversation in the museum. Um, the Nazis, uh, when they came to power, um, uh, really controlled everything, uh, education, uh, media, uh, youth, um, and understood that, um, that in order to, um, to manipulate and to um, get people in alignment with their thinking, um, that they had to use power in all its forms. And so um, you see, uh, uh, hopefully you can kind of see an image uh, from one of the many rallies that were held in Nazi Germany. Um, and we chose to show an image of, of the back of Hitler instead of Hitler front on, because we want people to understand that it wasn't Hitler alone, that if you look deeply at that photograph, Actually, there's thousands and thousands of people in that crowd. Um, and so this, this didn't happen solely because of Hitler. Um, it took a lot of, a, a, a lot of um, uh, both supporters um, and, and collaborators, as well as, of course, bystanders, people who, who didn't stand up. Um, and so in all of this seizing power, um, controlling media and, and education and, um, and, and transforming uh, the military and the police units to all focus on Nazi ideology. Um, there was uh, uh, with it uh, over and over again, of course, continued propaganda against Jews and other minorities. Um, one of the things, if, you, if we were together, you would see um, in this power installation, 
is a chart. Um, it's called the Nuremberg chart. And it's uh, a classification uh, for, for who's a Jew and who's not a Jew. And then any time that there's a genocide in particular, um, there's always a process of classification. And ultimately this was the first part of what was to become the Nuremberg laws, the first set of anti-Jewish laws in Nazi Germany. In developing these laws and creating this classification, the Nazis studied actually the Jim Crow laws in America. And I share this because I, I want us to remember that our histories aren't totally distinct in terms of, sadly, um, histories even of hate and discrimination have connections. Um, and so while we may on one hand think of uh, um, think of what happened in, in, in Europe, in Nazi Germany uh, and throughout Europe during the Holocaust as, as so uh, far removed, um, there are always connections and that's uh, one of them. Um, so as the Nazis took power, they slowly stripped away uh, the rights of, of Jews um, and others. And it wasn't overnight that the concentration camps and murder began. It was slowly taking away rights, taking away um, um, businesses and dehumanizing. And then of course, leading to violence. Um, and, and many of you may have heard of the Night of Broken Glass, the first moment of organized violence against Jews in, in Germany. And for many Jews living in Germany, their families had been there for generations. I mentioned Al Miller, his, his, his father was awarded a medal uh, for fighting uh, in World War I. They were a part of German society. They had actually one of the biggest businesses in Berlin, uh, textile business. Uh, they were Germans. It wasn't until Kristallnacht when on this night that uh, appeared like spontaneous violence, but really was an organized pogrom, organized rally against Jews, when 30,000 Jews were uh, rounded up and sent to concentration camps, Jewish businesses were destroyed and looted, and synagogues were destroyed and looted. It wasn't until this moment that many German Jews recognized, wow, this is really bad. Maybe we need to try to find a way out of Europe and find a place to uh, escape to. And if, if, if that was the case, it was very hard to find a country willing to take Jewish refugees, including the United States. Al, who I've mentioned a few times now, and his family were among the lucky ones after an incredible series of, uh, of, of process to try to seek um, uh, the papers to get to America. His family was able to eventually immigrate and escape Germany. Uh, but this was the moment. Um, people often say, you know, why didn't why didn't more Jews leave or why didn't they get out? Um, we can look back at history and see how it unfolds, but they couldn't at that time. And also, it was not easy to escape. Um, it was not easy to find a country willing to provide refuge to Jews at this time. So. As the war goes on, as the war begins, really, World War II, um, and the Nazi persecution of Jews increases in Germany, and as um, the Germans are occupying territory throughout Europe, um, they're beginning to, uh, to escalate violence and discrimination against Jews. We often think, and we're commemorating the UN Day of Holocaust Remembrance with uh, the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, we often think of um, Auschwitz and the camps, but actually um, the Nazis, uh, before they they were murdering Jews en masse in, in camps like Auschwitz, they were actually murdering Jews bullet by bullet. Um, what you're seeing is actually a recreation of a historical photograph utilizing tens of thousands of bullet casings. Um, and this is, um, um, one of the many images, it's estimated that more than one and a half million Jews were murdered in this fashion. Uh, the Nazis and their collaborators would go into a community. These were typically communities in the East, um, round up the whole Jewish community. They were never sent to ghettos or camps um, and they were murdered bullet by bullet. We have one survivor locally named Sam Boymel. 
who uh, actually was a, an eyewitness to this. Um, there are not a lot of eyewitnesses to these massacres, as you can imagine. Uh, Sam, Sam um, was rounded up with the rest of his town and he and his mother um, and sisters were taken uh, to where they were shooting the Jews. His mother saw what was happening to him. She gave him her sweater and she said, run my child, run. He ran away from this mass shooting um, and actually a neighbor saw him and pushed him back into the line and said, you're meant to die today. As you can imagine, his mother was incredibly distraught that he was uh, back in line and, um, and, and after she had told him to run. And she said, I told you to run. And he explained it to her and, and she said, okay, run a different direction. And, and he ran. And she said again, run my child, run. And fortunately, he got further away and he was able to run far enough away where he found somebody who was willing to hide him. And he ended up surviving the war and hiding. Um, this is just one, again, of the many, many stories that exist of the moments uh, of survival for these individuals and how each survivor story is unique. Um, and in Sam's case, we think about, you know, just this juxtaposition of one person who pushes him back in line and the other person who we call an upstander who had the courage to help him and to hide him um, to, to ensure that he would survive the war. And so when we're thinking about this history and thinking about what we can learn from it, we often think about um, the perpetrators, um, the bystanders and the upstanders, those who had the courage uh, to stand up to do something to help. Um, and and we think about, again, this question of how can we be upstanders today? Um, and that's a question that we talk a lot about in our work. We're gonna walk by, this is a replica of the, of the Warsaw Ghetto Wall. Um, and uh, if you were in the museum, when you come up to it, you're, you're not sure whether you're uh, standing on the outside looking in or the inside looking out. And again, um, it just challenges us to think about what perspectives, how, how we're looking at history, how we're looking at this history. Are we learning about it from, from the lens of the survivors who are there? Are we learning about it from uh, the Nazi history? Are we learning about it from um, other, other, other eyewitnesses? Um, and how, how do we understand what happened and the experiences of those who survived? Um, of course, then, um, while there's mass shooting, there's all, also more concentration uh, camps um, and thousands. Uh, we, we know of sort of these most well-known camps, but there were actually uh, uh, tens of thousands of concentration camps, slave labor camps, um, organized throughout Europe, um, where Jews and many other uh, non-Jewish uh, uh, victims were targeted. Uh, Roma in Sinti, uh, political prisoners, homosexuals, asocials, uh, people with disabilities, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, and, and many other uh, non-Jewish victims. And they were sent to camps in many, in many cases together. Um, and in, in some cases, of course, share common graves um, and common history. Um, and these are all uh, stories worth um, documenting and preserving. Um, our museum focuses uh, mostly on the Jewish experiences because those are the survivors whose stories we have captured. But there is a great need to continue sharing stories uh, of non-Jewish victims and capturing those before they're lost to time. Um, well, um, slave labor and murder and deprivation and starvation was going on um, throughout Europe uh, in these concentration camps and slave labor camps and ghettos. Um, at the same time, there was resistance. There was resistance in every camp, in every ghetto, um, both armed and unarmed resistance. Um, unarmed resistance being uh, even the will to survive, some could argue, or um, or the willingness to, to educate um, or, or to sneak uh, reading materials 
or um, or other other means of, of non-armed resistance. But there was also armed resistance. There were several armed rebellions um, throughout the camps and ghettos. And so often we hear, why didn't they resist? Um, well, there's many reasons for that, including just, just sheer uh, logistics, but there was resistance uh, in every way possible. Um, and a survivor you'll hear a clip from in a moment, but not yet, um, Warner Koppel, who uh, was a survivor of Auschwitz, he always said, in our minds, we always resisted. And actually, you know, even that will to survive was resistance because the Nazis' goal was that the Jews wouldn't survive. Um, and so even that sheer will to survive. We, of course, have heard, probably some of you have heard many stories of the deportation of people being shipped from ghettos or towns or slave labor camps to killing centers, to places like Auschwitz. Um, and we're in a train station. These, these, these deportations were typically with cattle cars. Um, and I'm sure many of you have heard stories of 80 to 100 people being crammed into a cattle car and shipped east, not knowing their destination. Um, this is the image you're looking at is, is a street in Poland um, after, after the Jews had been forced to line up and bring their belongings and come. And they were told to arrive at a certain time um, so that they could be, they didn't know where they were going. They were just told to pack uh, one bag and come. And this is just the, the, the scene of the empty street um, from one of these deportations. Of course, there were tens of thousands of these deportations to places like Auschwitz and many of the other death camps. So of course, As we think about uh, where these um, uh, deportations were sent to places like Auschwitz and Belgics and Helmno and Majdanek and Sobibor, um, today we're, we're marking the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. So I think we should hear the words, um, just a brief clip of a survivor, Roma Kultman, who talks about the dehumanization in Auschwitz. So if we can hear Roma's words. Maybe. The experience in uh, Auschwitz was the most dehumanizing that I have ever dreamt of. I, uh, I, I dreamt of being uh, a cat, a dog, anything, just not to be a human being because it was so dehumanized that that animals were treated better than human beings. It looks like that's not working, um, but I'll just share. Um, Roma Kaltman was a survivor who um, she's talking about in that segment. I don't know if you could see any of that, that she she was in Auschwitz. She was with her uh, sister and they, they um, they stayed very close and they actually sort of adopted a third sister, um, her good friend. Um, but she talks about wishing she were an animal because she felt like the animals she saw were treated better than they were um, in Auschwitz. And so I just, I, 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 I that clip just um, every time gives me chills um, and thinking about in just a few words, um, what what that means um, and what that means they would have uh, experienced and gone through. But the amazing thing is that even in places like Auschwitz and Belgics and all of these uh, horrible places, people like Roma and Warner and these others that I've mentioned find found the will to survive and found the will to go on um, and uh, even had moments of humanity um, Roma talks about 
how important it was to have her sister and her friend. And they gave each other hope and strength. And Warner talks about um, also uh, sort of the friends, friends he had um, and how that gave him great strength as well to survive. Uh, when we think about that, I think when we think about camps and we think about places like Auschwitz, um, there's many images that, that may come to our mind. Um, but I think one of the most iconic uh, artifacts uh, that we have is this, this uh, uniform, this camp uniform that I'm trying to get a good image of, um, that was worn by a gentleman named Leo Willick. Leo Willick survived, again, Auschwitz and Dachau, and he kept his uniform. Most survivors, as you can imagine, actually um, burned their uniform uniforms. They had worn them for sometimes years at a time and they were dirty and, and lice infected and they were not something that they wanted to keep. Uh, but, but Leo kept his uniform um, and he actually kept it in a box in his closet. And when he was having a really bad day, he would take the uniform out, put it on, look in the mirror and realize how lucky he was to be alive. Um, and so these memories that Leo has and Roma has and Warner has and Al has, obviously they don't, they don't go away, they stay with you um, and continue long after their survival. Um, but we are lucky that we have so many survivors that are with us, that have shared their story, that have documented their journeys. Um, and when we think about today and this day of Holocaust remembrance um, and the focus that the UN has chosen on rebuilding, what I think we can all draw inspiration from is this incredible will to not only survive during the war, but the incredible will to go on and rebuild and have families. Earlier today, uh, we had a program with a Holocaust survivor named Anna Ornstein, who went on to be a child psychiatrist um, and, and was is still uh, prolific in her field of, of psychiatry. And she said that somebody told her uh, another psychiatrist told her many years ago that the survivors actually probably shouldn't have had children because they were too traumatized and too too challenged by what they had experienced. But we know that the survivors did go on. They rebuilt their lives. They had families. Um, they contributed to our city um, and to uh, and to the world in many ways. Um, and and that's something again that. Whether, whether we have connections to this history or other histories or experiences or traumas, um, that we can be reminded of the power of the human spirit and the ability to go on even in times of great loss. Um, I want to pivot um, a bit and uh, start connecting a little bit for a moment before we, before we go to more conversation and questions um, to connecting to, again, today. Um, and I think the, the best way we can begin to think about, you know, we just went on a very, very quick tour of our museum and reflecting on some of the history. Um, I think the best way to help us um, think about moving forward would be to hear, hear the story of another survivor. Um, that I've mentioned a few times, and that is Warner Koppel and what compelled him to begin sharing his story. So if we can pull up that clip of Warner and why he began sharing, why he began speaking and what he hopes it does. Werner Koppel, a Holocaust survivor, was living in Cincinnati. One day, he opened the Cincinnati Enquirer insert and noticed an article. In it, a man was quoted questioning the authenticity of what he called the stuff about the six million, and he called the diary of Anne Frank a fake. 
It had been 31 years since Werner Koppel's death march out of Auschwitz. And as he read, he felt fear and outrage. In that moment, Werner faced a choice. Fight back with anger and aggression. Or find a better way. His perspective and leadership moved him to stand up for justice and to speak out publicly against intolerance and indifference, to bear witness and rise to the challenge of the moment. Werner Koppel was the first survivor in Cincinnati to share his story publicly. Before he died at age 91, he opened hearts and minds, showing us all how to become an upstander. So I hope you got most of that. Um, and I think uh, Warner um, challenges us again to think about what can we learn from this and how can we um, uh, be the best of humanity today. Uh, he, he overcame enormous, uh, enormous challenges to share his story. Um, and spoke, as you heard in the film, publicly. Um, and we want our visitors to think about that question of what are the strengths we each have as individuals um, to make a difference in the world? What do we do with this history? What do we do with the lessons? Um, and recognize, again, that all of us have this potential to make a difference. Um, we're not all the same, of course. Uh, some of us are excellent uh, writers, some of us are excellent orators, some of us are creative, but whatever our strengths are, we can use it to make a difference. Um, and so Warner helps us think about that question of how, how do each of us um, become upstanders? And we move into, we moved together into our humanity gallery uh, where we feature stories. Storytelling is uh, incredibly important, as you can see, to the work we do. We feature stories of individuals who, who are upstanders, who have um, uh, uh, used their strengths to make a difference in the world. Um, and we focus on stories of responding to genocide, protecting civil rights, sharing our world, promoting pluralism, finding home, um, and standing up to hate. And um, we always ask our visitors, and so I'll ask you to think about how are you gonna use your strengths to be an upstander? How are you going to be the best of humanity today? It's a question, an urgent question for all of us in our real time. Um, and this just gives you a little bit of a sense of uh, uh, the gallery. I wish I could tell you all of the 18 incredible stories of upstanders um, that we feature there. Um, and I'm sure you know your own stories um, and have stories to write as well. Um, so I think we should close the tour with the words of another survivor, if it will work, I hope. Um, the words of Edith Carter that speaks to this message of all of us um, making a difference. There's one, one almighty over all of us, regardless of who we are, what color we are and how we speak and whatever, one. And it's not going to be uh, permitting it that the, the destroy humankind and the world. Something will happen. And the most important thing is that everybody, every human being, has the obligation to contribute somehow to it, that this world is going to be better. So Edith, Edith did you, it was, it was um, skipping on my end. I don't know if you, were you able to see the Edith's video? Yeah, I was able to see it. Oh, okay. So it's, maybe it's just on my end. That's good. So yeah, Edith's words of, um, every one of us has the obligation to contribute somehow to this world um, is, is what we hope um, learning about this history does for all of us. So thank you. 
And thank you so much, Sarah, for taking the time to discuss the legacy of the Holocaust, how we fit into that narrative, and for giving us a tour of the Cincinnati Holocaust Museum. We will now move into the Q&A portion. Please continue to use the live chat feature for all of your questions. Um, the first question that we have is, do you have any advice for how we can continue to remember outside of these designated places? Um, so that's a great question. I mean, you know, uh, there's an incredible amount of books, of, um, of, of films, of, of stories, um, you know, and there's so much available, especially now online. So, you know, aside from these, these moments like a Holocaust Remembrance Day, I would just encourage people to, you know, visit even websites like ours or the U.S. Holocaust Museum or other places um, and books. And, and, you know, the other thing I would just say is if you know anybody, you know, even, even from any part of the world that was alive at that time, ask them if what they remember and what their stories are. Um, don't lose those to time. Thank you. Waiting for the next question to pop up on screen. There it is. Um, this one is from Natalie. Uh, she's asking, Back to your note about words mattering and people seeking scapegoats, is there is it ever alarming to hear similar propaganda today? How do you suggest society should respond to that? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, and, you know, I do think uh, there's a, a sub, several parts of it. First of all, that words matter, that what people say matters. And we have to really think carefully about that. And we hear often, you know, in, in whatever ways, you know, oh, well, this person didn't mean that or they didn't. I think we have to listen when people are saying, and especially when people are using hateful language, uh, we have to be very, very um, uh, hesitant to make excuses for that. Um, and I am alarmed by the deeply um, hateful rhetoric that we continue to see um, in so many places. Um, and think that, you know, it, it takes all of us to speak up and to, um, to use words that are healing and not hurtful um, and, and challenge this. Um, you know, I, 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 I think that all of us have a responsibility towards, um, towards challenging that hate and vitriol we see right now. Um, and, um, and everybody has a role to play, so. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, the next question is, how were the Nazis able to identify who was Jewish, especially in places where it was extremely assimilated? So that's a great question. Um, there's a couple answers to that. Um, one, one is, um, you know, Jews up to this point, I mean, even, even if they were very assimilated, I mean, they were still typically proud to be Jewish. So they may have belonged to a synagogue or something, even if they didn't attend, you know, synagogue, they may have still belonged or been involved. Um, often um, your identity papers may have had religion marked in it. Um, so there were many ways also, even again, even if you were totally assimilated, like the Miller family that I mentioned, they were fairly assimilated, very well to do um, Germans, um, their neighbors still knew they were Jewish. So either you were on lists or anything, but also, you know, people knew you were Jewish. And so, um, you know, it was, it was, you know, not as easy as we think to just kind of hide that identity. And then the other big factor uh, in particular for men, you know, is, is circumcision. I mean, if you, if, I mean, if you really wanted to find out if somebody was trying to hide their identity, um, you know, you knew who was a Jew through, through that that way as well. Wow. Um, that's, yeah, that's incredible. Well, because in Europe at the time, non-Jewish men were not circumcised. So, I mean, that's a horrible thing to talk about, but that's a way in which, you know, if, 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 a, if a Jew was trying to hide, hide as a, or, or, or pass as a Gentile during the war, you know, the first thing a Nazi would say is, I just, you know, you know, it sounds horrific, but, you know, pull down your pants. Um, so. Yeah. Um, so we're waiting for the next question to pop back up, but, oh, here it is. So this question, social progress moves at snail pace 
snail's pace compared to technological progress. Humanity will never forget how to build a smartphone. But we need reminders to reject fascism. Why is that? What else can we do? You know, uh, I've been in some conversations about this and I'm not exactly sure um, if this is where you're going, but I totally agree. I mean, technology is always ahead. And, you know, even if we look back at history, right, with with radio and TV, and there's always been questions of how technology develops and what does that do? I think, especially with social media and, and all these things, you know, we, we see an incredible proliferation of hate um, on, on these platforms. And, um, you know, I think, there is gonna to have to be some regulation um, developed, some method, right? Like there are rules and regulations with what you can say and not say on uh, um, on TV. And I think we're gonna to have to develop some norms. Um, that's one piece of it. I also think, um, you know, whatever we as individuals can do to when we see, um, whether it's misinformation or hateful information, you know, if we see it around us that we can call it out in actually a way that's respectful, because if we just, you know, you see a lot of these sort of hateful um, back and forth and, and things like that, but um, if we can help educate, but um, yeah, there, there's, th this is a big issue that there's a lot of, a, a lot of different aspects of work that I think has to be done um, to address it. But, you know, I, I'm, this isn't the first time this challenge, I think, as the, as the person noted, this isn't, Technology is always sort of ahead of, of where we need to be regulating as well. Yeah, um, definitely also extremely relevant with a lot that we work with as well. So definitely very important for us to be having these conversations and continue to learn. Well, and to that point, Hannah, actually, the one thing I would say, and I'm sure this is something that comes up in the work you do, I would imagine, is that, you know, we are thinking a lot about making sure that kids are educated about um, you know, propaganda um, uh, about um, uh, news literacy and understanding content and sources and um, fact, of course, this is a, a continued conversation um, for all of us. But so in part, there's some, you know, regulation and some tools that are going to have to be developed or implemented, I think, to, to on that end, but on sort of the user side, we need to do a better job educating in particular youth about um, you know how to understand um, all of this and and how to um, how to um, um, manage the information that they're getting um, so quickly and in, in, in any moment. Yes, definitely. Could you be um, share a few common myths myths misconceptions? I cannot speak right now um, about the Holocaust. Yeah, oh, we could go on and on about that. Um, so thanks for that question. Um, you know, I think some of the myths we hear are um, that um, there's so many different ones. I mean, that um, Jews um, went like sheep to slaughter so that they didn't, you know, that they didn't, they were just, you know, they just, they were, they were totally not, not resistant in, in, in any way. Um, we hear that um, things like, um, Hitler, uh, another common thing we hear all the time, people ask all the time is, well, was Hitler Jewish? Um, and there's there's sort of this myth that maybe one of Hitler's great grandparents or something like that, that's never been uh, proven. Um, it is possible, I'm not saying it's not possible, but there's, there's not been um, proof of that. And so that's one we hear a lot. Um, we hear, um, you know, that Jews were used and made into soap or lampshades. Um, the Nazis did horrific things um, and murdered and, and horrific things, but that's not one that, that that's actually we know of is true. So um, I could go on, but those are just a couple that, that come to mind immediately. Um, or that, you know, or that Jews were, uh, the, uh, one other I'll mention is that Jews were somehow a large, a large population in, in Germany. And actually in Germany, Jews were less than 1% of the population. And so it was a very small minority, um, which I think helps to contextualize uh, uh, the history when you understand how small. Now, now in Poland, Jews were more like 10% of the population, um, bigger, bigger um, minority, but still a relatively small uh, minority in Europe. 
Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I had no idea that uh, Jews were only 1%. Our next question is, why is the advancement of Holocaust education so important today? So I am a big advocate, first of all, for history. I think history informs our present in general. So, you know, I am, of course, um, because of the work I do and, and also my personal connection, deeply passionate about this history. But I'll start by saying all history matters. And, you know, we in Cincinnati have a strong partnership with uh, the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, which is a museum that's dedicated to the story of the Underground Railroad in relation to um, the history of slavery in America. Um, you know, I am as passionate about learning that history as I am about this, because like we know uh, with the Holocaust, the Holocaust, um, the impact changed the world and changed um, our understanding of uh, genocide, of right from wrong, of uh, mass atrocities. And so, um, you know, every historical moment has impact and helps to us to understand how we got to where we are. On top of that, thank you for this question. Um, I think it's relevant today, sadly, even more so because we see hate, because we see scapegoating, because we see, um, you know, the Nazis didn't have social media and um, and all of these technologies, which actually, we, I mean, we shouldn't even go down this path, but we say to ourselves sometimes, like, what if they did, right? What if they had this technology? But, um, but, um, but we know they use the same methods and, and in terms of um, lies and um, that that we see in our world today, right? And, um, um, uh, um, propagating conspiracy theories and, and things like that. And so um, we need to challenge ourselves to recognize um, not that history um, repeats itself. I, I think it actually is more it echoes. And we have to ask ourselves, what can we learn from those echoes? What can we learn? Are there any, it's not gonna happen the same way, um, but, um, but, but, but we have to learn so we can pay attention to what's going on um, in America and around the world as well. Um, and, and because, you know, it's also important, hopefully to, to humanize us and to, to, to make us um, empathetic towards the plight of the Uyghurs in um, in China or the Rohingya in Myanmar um, or other other groups who are right now experiencing genocide. Um, and so if we can have empathy for the stories of Edith or Warner or Roma, um, hopefully that challenges us to think about who are the people that we need to be speaking out for today. Yes, definitely. That's one of the biggest lessons that my grandfather left with me as well and is what led me on this career path. Um, so we have one last question before, oh, we're gonna ask it right now. Um, what advice would you give to the young generation facing anti-Semitism today from BDS groups and other? So great question. Um, I, I don't know if everybody is familiar with BDS, Boycott, Divestment, Sanctions Movement, um, which is really um, an anti-Israel movement. Um, and and anti-Semitism um, has various forms today. Um, you know, it could be in the form of Holocaust denial, it can be in the form of hate speech, um, and it can also show up in the form of anti-Israel activity and the BDS movement is um, is an anti-Israel um, initiative. And so, um, you know, I think <laughs> that's a huge question, um, but I think we have to recognize that the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is a conflict and it's an ongoing conflict and we have to look at it in the context of that, um, but challenge people to understand um, that context and um, how, um, how uh, that BDS movement is actually a movement to, um, to delegitimize Israel's right to exist um, which is different than trying to understand a political geographical uh, conflict. Um, I'm not sure that's helpful, but because it's a, a big, big complex issue. Um, but I think um, I think much more education is needed about the overall history, um, where we are, but also acknowledgement that, uh, and, and this might be an un, uh, you know uh, 
not perceived the same way by every person in the conversation today, acknowledgement that, um, you know, uh, there are injustices on, on, on both sides of that conflict and recognize those. But at the same time, to say Israel doesn't have a right to exist is not looking at a resolution. It's looking at uh, uh, wiping Israel off the map. And so making people understand how that, how that is anti-Semitism. Um, because quite frankly, um, you know, especially in the aftermath of the Holocaust, um, we know that um, no one wanted Jews. Um, and sadly that, that, I hope that doesn't happen again, but if, if it does, um, Quite frankly, as a Jew, it gives me some um, comfort to know that there is a place I can go as a Jew. I've thought about that even in our current political moment. So, Yes. Um, thank you so much for coming to speak with us, answering all of our questions, and really helping us understand how we fit into this entire narrative. And I also want to thank everybody who joined this live stream for taking time out of your busy schedules to come and listen and um, learn more about the Holocaust because I think that it is extremely important for all of us to continue to educate ourselves and to continue to have these conversations so that we can learn for the future. Thank you, it was it was an honor to be with you and um, I, I appreciate um, people remembering and thinking about what we can learn from this history. Awesome, thank you so much, Sarah. Bye.